No, you did not download the wrong podcast. This is the Calypso Cigar Review Podcast. We just got a little bit of a different introduction today because we're doing a little bit of a different show. So stay tuned to find out more. Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to episode 14 of the Calypso Cigar Shop and Lounge Podcast. This is... Catorce, yes. This is Brandon, your host, along with Randy Rankin, and our special guest today, Pedro Haley. Hello. Welcome, Pedro. Pedro nice to be here. Thank is you. a longtime customer at the yes. Calypso Cigar Shop and Lounge. And he's become a good friend. And we are at the Calypso Cigar Shop and Lounge over in Richardson. What's the address there, Randy? Uh, 1401 East Arapaho Road. Sweet E is in Elephant. Pedro's doing the... He's doing the old school lighting it with the cedar. He lit the cedar lit, man. With the soft flame. Yeah, look at that. Damn, Pedro. Look at Pedro. High class. It I helps have, It helps when you talk into the mic, Pedro. I, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I've just heard, you know, aficionados or people who are in the know that uh, you can um, uh, distort the flavors by... Mm-hmm. Yeah, enveloping it uh, or lighting it with something other than the cedar. So yeah. Pedro is still, in, and I like this. I admire. He's still in that romantic stage of the cigar <laughs> yeah. process. Yeah. I, I did the I did the um, the match thing for. I still do the match thing at home if I'm in in the house and no one's in there and I'm not supposed to be smoking in the house, but I light one up anyway. <laughs> but uh, I also have the Alec Bradley soft flame that I use quite a bit at home, and uh, man, for the most part, I'm a torch guy. Um, but I, I like to. Um, toast it so I'll, I'll take it pretty far away and just basically bring the flame to it and let it toast slowly yeah. it takes me a little bit to light it but it works for me it's, it's cool. worth it it is it's worth it so how long have you been a cigar smoker Pedro I have been a cigar smoker now for I'd have to say how close to almost a year and a All half right. maybe yeah. 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 So he's about and you've been coming in here about that long mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah I'm about the two year mark so we're about the same okay in our experience level here very cool very cool. Okay. Mm, we're it's time for the reveal. Yes. <laughs> Pedro Haley is the son of Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and founding father Bill Haley of Bill Haley and His Comets. And I was reading that that title came from the, the obviously, the Halley's Comet, because mm-hmm. back in the day, people would mispronounce that and call it Haley's Comet. That's right. Yes. Very cool. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about your dad. <laughs> not, no, not his musical side. I mean, I was just, you know... Um, well, my dad passed away when I was 10 years old mm-hmm. uh, in 1981, uh, so uh, the older I get, my memories of him are more fleeting, but uh, there's always those indelible marks that, that never fade as long as, as, uh, as the older you get, they stay, they stay with me, but um, I always remember my dad as being a, a really laid-back guy who always seemed to be kind of in retirement Mm -hmm. and he had um he was a very simple guy Mm -hmm. Uh, he didn't he didn't have very many interests in life uh besides fishing Mm -hmm. and um music obviously well actually you know i i think that at the end of his life or when when i was around when when his when he got married to my mom, his third wife, uh, by that time, um, in the seventies, I'd say, uh, music was really starting to kind of be this, as, uh, as I saw in a documentary one time, I think it was, uh, Artie Shaw in, mm-hmm. in Ken Burns's jazz documentary, great mm-hmm. jazz documentary, the 10 part jazz documentary. Mm-hmm. Artie Shaw, who is one of the few big band leaders who actually survived that era and still alive, I believe. He might wow. have passed away since that documentary was finished. But right. he said that, that um, Begin the Begin, which was Artie Shaw's big hit in the mm-hmm. 40s, became an albatross that hung around his neck. Right. And it was expected of him to be played every night. Right. And not just one time, not two times. And my dad, uh, I think, fell under that spell. I mean, Artie Shaw actually retired for a yeah, long time. Right. Um, he he left a, an incredible career at that time in the 40s uh, as, a, as one of the most popular band leaders of the time because he just didn't... He was Burn burned out, but he also felt like uh, everybody just wanted to hear the same thing over right. and over again. Right. And my dad, uh, I believe he fell under that same spell and... and um, 
with rock around the clock with rock around the clock shake rattle and roll see you la- see you later alligator right. and, Those were and all the other all, all, all the all the other with. things if if you were more of a bill haley fan you wanted to hear some of the deeper cuts mm-hmm. but my dad's true passion in life even from a kid on was country music mm-hmm. and he aspired uh for many, many years, he actually cut several country music albums, mm-hmm. and like the last record he recorded has some country music on it. Yeah. Um, he he wanted to sing country music. Uh, that was really his true passion. Right. Anyway, getting back to what I remember about my dad. Um, uh, my earliest memories, and I was just thinking about this the other day, as a matter of fact, was was of uh, um, we lived in in this the port city of Veracruz in Mexico, in the state of Veracruz, mm-hmm. in the mid 1970s, and my father uh, loved it there because obviously it was a great opportunity for him to go fishing mm-hmm. all the time. <laughs> And the music of that part of Mexico is uh, very unique compared to the other regions. It's it's a it's a, a very unique mix of of highly rhythmic syncopated music that is connected to, in one way, it's connected to Cuban Afro Cuban music, mm-hmm. and in another way, there are other styles that are connected to, believe it or not. Uh, Spanish Renaissance music, oh, okay. uh, very interesting yeah. uh, combination, and that for me as a child, I remember uh, walking the streets of downtown Veracruz, which is where Cortez landed. So mm-hmm. it's uh, the oldest city in Mexico. Nice. Um, <clears throat> Veracruz itself is very similar to New Orleans, and um, so it was a, a wonderful place to. to to walk around with your dad as, at five and six years old. And uh, I have indelible memories of, of walking around, holding his hand while he, you know, chain smoked cigarettes and uh, listened to music and watched uh, giant ships come into the harbor mm. from all over the world. Um, we had hurricanes. We had a, my dad uh, bought a house right on the actual um the the street that goes along the water mm-hmm. uh, there, the, there was a house right on our house was right on it and I rem, you know I distinctly remember all of that and I remember uh, that my father was very very happy in Veracruz um, unfortunately my mother wasn't no. <laughs> <laughs> my mother didn't like Veracruz she thought it was too hot and humid and it is, and it is. Sure it's it is. it's uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, imagine driving from Corpus Christi south along the coast for another what maybe four or five hundred miles yeah and uh and then you hit veracruz uh-huh. so but from there we moved to harlingen texas because my mother was not um she just she had her way mm-hmm. and <laughs> she uh, as as women often keep, keep and, mama happy that's and, what you gotta uh, do we moved to a small town in the in the very southern tip of uh, South Texas, uh, a town very at, at this time in 1976. Oh, guy, I must have had maybe 3,000 people. Maybe I don't know. I, I I don't have that data in front of me. Right. But it was a small town, and um, but the advantage to it was is that it was close to Mexico. So my mom got the chance to visit. My mother's from Mexico, obviously, and. Mm. Um, she got a chance to to go back across the border and be in her homeland for a while uh because harlingen is only about 20 minutes away from from matamoras mexico correct and uh my dad had the opportunity to be close to the ocean which because harlingen is about uh, 25 minutes away from port isabel which is the sister city of south padre island okay Mm -hmm. And in Veracruz and uh, South and Port Isabel, my dad actually owned uh, fishing boats in both nice. places. Yeah, my dad, believe it or not, in Veracruz actually did some professional fishing. And, oh, really? Um, he did spend a lot of time in Veracruz. He'd go out uh, at night and he'd be gone for uh, 24 hours or so and come back with a catch take it to the um, the fishmongers there in Veracruz in the port and sell his catch. And, wow. uh, although I don't believe that he, um, obviously I wasn't perusing the, the finances of the family, but I don't believe he really needed the money, but he loved to, to sport fish. The yeah. irony of the entire thing 
And uh, this carries on with me, and I think I got it from my dad simply by just being around him and watching him, is that he didn't like to eat fish. He didn't like fish, and I don't either, but I love fishing. I love to go fishing. I love the sport. I love the serenity. Um, I love the calm and the the opportunity for contemplation that comes with it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's an amazing time to have great cigar time. Yes, yes, (laughs) we were. I was going to say that if you weren't. And And we haven't mentioned what cigar we're smoking. Oh, yeah, Uh, we are are reviewing a cigar today, and it is the uh, Cane F. F. The Lancero. F. Lancero. It's the, the yearly release. They only release it one time a year. It comes in a nice tubo. And a nice 10 pack box. Mm-hmm. And uh, even for a Lancero, that cold draw is just flavorful and tasty. And just. Uh, yeah, and it's, know, and it's actually at a great. good price, too. I mean, you can it's get under these seven bucks, you know, really cheaply. And like range, the box absolutely. is in the. That's $80 or $100. No, it's cheap. 70, 70 bucks. Yeah, $70 bucks. range yeah. for 10 really good cigars and tubos. And the great thing about tubos is you don't have to worry about humidification. Humidif- I can't even talk. Humidification. I'm making up words again. Yeah, you are. Humidification, you're if you're going to you know, take it on the road or whatever, just stick it in your pocket and you're good to go. And it's mm-hmm. a great cigar. Yes, and, I, I like it. I enjoy it very much. I, I, um, and you didn't I, like it. Well, yeah, I, I love I love Oliva and um, Oliva V especially. Um, I, I enjoy and uh, I have many, I have had in the past many Oliva V Lanceros, but I had the thanks to Randy here one day. He recommended that I have one of these and I just thought it was kind of a knockoff of the Oliva V, mm-hmm. but uh, in retrospect and, and after savoring it i realized that that was quite an interesting quite an interesting smoke and very um unique mm-hmm. although allied very closely mm-hmm. with the oliva v mm-hmm. um i still believe it, it it was it was nice i mean and i enjoy it very yeah, much he sent me a text that night said uh, cause when i when he left i was under the impression he really didn't like the cigar sent me a text i can't stop thinking about it so it must be there must be <laughs> something to it if i can't get it out of my mind yeah that's a good but, little uh, smoke it's man. a great smoke i love it so you like the Oliva 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 V? God, yeah, I can't. Oliva. Again, yeah. Oliva V cigars. You we really had the are. Oliva V Maduro. That's like um, a yearly release. Yeah, they only do that every. You know, year. I don't believe I've actually had that. We, we've no. got it. Well, we might hook you up sometime. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm not a big Maduro fan like you guys are. I, I believe. Well, I'm not the, either. It's just I like certain Maduros. Yeah. But Maduro in general is not my. I like Maduro. Yeah. yeah. You guys can suck it. Well, there you go. <laughs> All right. Now you're in the in the minority, so you can suck it. Okay. Well, right? fine. I'm okay. gonna suck on my whiskey here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, there you go. See, we bust each other's chops from time to time, and it's fun. Okay. Good, so good times. now let's talk music. I happened to in the in high school, I had to write a paper on '50s rock, and I read a book called "The Rockin' '50s," and I don't remember the guy's name. I think his last name was Shaw. But anyway, if you get a chance to find it on Amazon, maybe Brandon's going to look it up here. Yep, you Excellent guys keep book. If you're interested in the 50s rock, that's a great book. And your dad was interviewed in it. And so oh. I was, I, my mom played those three songs you just mentioned, plus yeah. Skinny Minnie all the time. Skinny Minnie. And I, I don't like Skinny Minnie only because of that, because uh, she called bad. us Skinny Minnie, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So. I love but, Skinny Minnie. But the Minnie. song itself is great. Yeah. So tell a little bit about your dad's origins. So he started off wanting to do country, and it kind of what led to Western Swing. And Well, you're, uh, you're right. It is Shaw. Okay. Uh, my, my dad's father, my paternal grandfather, was, um, as far as I know, was a coal miner in, uh, in Kentucky. Uh, Fire Brick, Kentucky is from where my that side of the family hails from. And um, in uh, I believe in 1921, I just saw this in the documentary, very fascinating. Uh, 1921, Henry Ford opened up his giant Model T factory mm-hmm. in, a, in a neighborhood or a, a suburb of, De- of Detroit named Highland Park, mm. Michigan. Uh, it's still there today, and uh, it's a bad neighborhood. But my grandfather moved to there to to go to work for for uh, Henry Ford because uh, Kentucky wasn't working out. I guess okay. I don't know. Probably not um, a lot of jobs in yeah, Fire Brick, Kentucky. Uh, yeah, I would I would <laughs> imagine so. And so my dad was born in Highland Park, Michigan, in 1925. Uh, but shortly thereafter. For reasons that are probably more clear to to other my half brother more than me, mm-hmm. uh, they moved to um, 
a small town uh, close to Chester, Pennsylvania. I guess it's more of a, a part of the this area of Philadelphia, but it was in the outskirts. It was it was in the country, and it's uh, various names: Booths, Booth Win, mm -hmm. and uh, Booths Corner. Um, a small, very small. I you know you could call it a hamlet, and. Okay. Uh, that's where he, my dad grew up, was out there, and, and uh, my, his whole life, you know, whenever my dad tried to describe himself or anybody interviewed him, he would always say that sim simplified, uh, he's just a hillbilly at heart. Mm. And it, it's, a, it's funny to imagine somebody that's a, what we consider a Yankee, mm -hmm. us, us people from Texas, um, a man from that part of the world cons uh, referring to himself as a hillbilly, but we must remember that... Uh, you know, the hills are everywhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so and it's also ironic then that he would become one of the founding fathers of rock and roll. As a, yeah. You know, as from a, considering himself just a hillbilly. And yeah. apparently the hills are alive with the sound of music as well. Yeah. That is true. Thank you. That is true. Well, mi mixing in the, yeah, the bro theater. little Broadway. <laughs> right. Uh, All right. Pedro's <laughs> wife's in the background and she's <laughs> applauding that. Yeah. So um, my grandmother was uh, actually hardcore English. She had an accent, uh, last name of Green. And uh, my father was, my grandfather, excuse me, was of old Irish stock. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my grandmother could play the piano a little bit. And uh, my grandfather could play guitar and mandolin. And my dad picked up a little bit uh, from there, but um, he he developed quite a talent for for uh, play, playing, accompanying himself, and singing. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, I guess in 19, 1935, he would have been ten years old. His heroes were on the on the movie screens, you mm -hmm. know, and it were it was the, the the movie cowboys that were really popular at the time. The Gene serials, Autry and you know, yeah. good stuff. Uh, Gene Autry and uh, I don't know. My, I don't know if uh, Roy Rogers. I know Gene Autry for sure was mm -hmm. one of my dad's heroes, and uh, so he, he he admired the 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 country music, and he admired the the lifestyle of the cowboy or the imagined lifestyle that he got from from watching it on the on the movies, and. Uh, but you know, by the time he reached sixteen, seventeen, eighteen years old, he was already playing in this on this what you know you'd call the circuits and mm -hmm. uh, playing around. And um, he uh, got married very early on. I think he was about twenty-one years old when he got married for the first time. And uh, the he was a DJ. He got a job as a DJ, but at the same time, he was also promoting himself. <laughs> while while being a DJ, he'd say, well, this is Bill Haley coming to you from WPWA from Chester, Pennsylvania, and uh, here's Bill Haley going to sing your song now. <laughs> I don't blame him. That's pretty convenient. Yeah, yeah. how about that? And uh, so he had a local following there in, in that area called, of uh, Chester, and, and um, it's an interesting part of the, the country. We, we drove by recently, and I, uh, a few years ago, and I got to realize... Uh, that 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 part of the the country, uh, Philadelphia and uh, New Jersey and New York City are all in incredibly close proximity. Right. Yeah. Uh, but so is Delaware, and uh, it's it's very funny. I mean, you can from Chester, Pennsylvania, which is by the way the the hometown of one of America's greatest uh, classical music composers, Samuel Barber. Um, Chester, Pennsylvania, you can easily drive to New Jersey or Delaware within a couple of hours. So yeah, it's all packed in up there. Yep. Yeah, it is. The, the circuit was, was uh, mainly um, sea, seaport bars in Philadelphia and uh, then also places in New Jersey and Delaware and uh, pl singing, singing country music, especially um, music that he had, uh, by this time he had a, a group of people that were backing him up that were all also admirers of, of country music. But this was an interesting time in American pop music because everybody liked all kinds of different kinds of music, you know. I think that... Uh, I don't know. I, I can't. I can't speak exactly. You'd have to. We'd really have to speak to somebody that lived at that time. But I believe that, uh, if, you know, if you were in, let's say, 1939, 
um, you were probably listening to big band music mm -hmm. and at the same time what they called race records, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. which is what we now know of as uh, rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could also be listening to um you grand know one, one of the grand old opry or one of the one of the most popular acts of the time which was bob wills and his texas playboys and western swing was um something that just took my dad by storm and uh, everybody in the band was just in love with the style because it was such an interesting hybrid of mm -hmm. music which was um you know a, a, a country aesthetic uh applied to what was probably the most popular brand of music at the time which is swing mm -hmm. and uh, western swing is is a, a really interesting thing because it led to um what we later well i mean if we examine a little bit if we take it a little bit further on mm -hmm. you can easily identify elements of swing music or western swing via swing mm -hmm. in some of the early, early music that my dad uh, recorded yeah. yeah and uh i mean i i would i would even venture to say that uh, chuck berry's maybelline if you if you really take a close look to look to listen to it mm -hmm. I mean, it, it there's you could sing it like a country song. Yeah, oh, I mean, absolutely. you could easily sing it as a country song. And uh, you know, Elvis described rock and roll music as a gospel and rhythm and blues. Uh, but then you had the rockabilly, which your dad was a little bit into that too, as well, which was the element of country music brought in with the gospel and the rhythm and blues. And as you and I have talked off mic, you know, before swing and western swing were just as big uh, mm -hmm. an influence in, in a lot of artists maybe not every rock artist you know fats domino might not have been a influenced by it but certainly elvis buddy holly yeah your yeah. dad yeah you could definitely definitely hear it yeah absolutely i mean i th well fats domino is very interesting because uh i don't think fats domino is uh well he's er he's obviously one of the pioneers of rock and roll but his he really was singing r and b music he was i mean that, that's really r and b music and and the great the great argument and and it's it's not something that you can it's it's unwinnable uh to be able to i mean it's silly to even argue about it you know who was first or who did what or mm -hmm. or you know who is who is the originator it's a it's a it's a moot point and and it is. and it's 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 not worth the time to even try and attempt it and but people still do you yeah. know yeah. well but people people always associated with you know who was the first one really to record it doesn't mean it wasn't existing already for years you know? right but even that everyone was recording so much at the same time yeah you know I've, I've watched several rock and roll documentaries you know that book that we referenced earlier just really got me into 50s music mm -hmm. my mom played a lot of 50s music mm -hmm. so yeah uh so I've seen a lot of documentaries, and it's funny. You know, one documentary will say "Shaboom" mm. by the Crew Cuts was the first true rock and roll song. Well, that's, then you watch another one; it'll that's say "Wild." Well, <laughs> that's one, wild some one. people will say "Maybelline" is mm. the first rock and roll song. Well, I've heard uh, I've "Rocket heard 88, Rocket 88 by your dad yeah. has been considered one of the yeah. first rock and roll songs. I, I think that, um, and I, uh, I, I say this with all true respect to, to every musician that was a part of this because. I think that the musicians from the 1950s, with the exception of uh, Elvis Presley, uh, have gotten a very bad, um, they just really haven't gotten a whole lot of respect. I mean, I think that by 1960, um, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, well, Buddy Holly was dead already. Right. My dad, uh, you know, the the list goes on. Eddie Cochran was dead. Mm -hmm. um, little you know, Richard, had given little me Richard retired was for a now while. being a preacher. Yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, by 1960, the world was changing so quickly. Chuck, uh, Chubby Checker had come out with the twist, and mm -hmm. and uh, all these originators of this truly, I mean, they. Um, Historians say that in music, you know, and, uh, you know, just a little side note here. I, I'm a I'm a music historian. I have a degree in in in, in music, and uh, um, I teach music at uh, at the college level. So I I I know whereof I speak in a certain sense that um, there is a a, a certain bent, um, and I don't mean to say that this has been on on purpose, but I believe that there is a certain bent 
or uh, advantage given to musicians of African American origins uh, when it comes to uh, rock and roll because of whether it be that they're trying, historians are trying to make up for the mm -hmm the mistreatment of African Americans in our country or whether they want to just simply prove a point yeah. that uh, all the, um, and I hate to put this in terms of black and white, but my point is, is that, uh, you know, most of them, a lot of the, the white musicians have been disparaged so right. much right. Uh, that they stole black music and all of this. And I don't believe that to be the case. For example, hold that thought. Let's uh, let's yeah. make this the next segment because I want to go long on this next segment because he's really hitting my hot button here. Oh, okay, okay, all right. <laughs> okay. We're good. We're at the end of the first third, anyways. So we're gonna take a little break here and we'll be right back. <laughs> Alrighty, everybody, we're back for the second segment of the Calypso Cigar Review podcast, and we are here at the Calypso Cigar Shop and Lounge in Richardson, Texas. You know, if someone wanted to, to call and order something, what number would they call, Randy? 972-761-9903. 972-761-9903. For the cheap seats. All right, yeah. we're back for segment two, and you guys were getting into a heated debate here about... No, it wasn't going to be a debate. It was going to be, I know exactly where he's going, and I'm going to chime in a lot on this one, because I... This is one of my pet peeves about the, uh, what's the word, the revisionist history of being written about 50s rock and roll. So you were saying you were going to go toward, you were talking about covers, is what you were going to go towards? About? Yes, I, I was, I was going to mention that there's been um, a lot of people, I don't understand where this exactly comes from, but that people accuse musicians of stealing music right and whether it be from another white musician or and this is in particular this is where it really gets uh vitriolic is that a white musician stole mm -hmm. a black musician's music and i i my father experienced this and uh, the irony of the entire thing is that yes of course shake rattle and roll is actually a big joe turner mm -hmm. song mm -hmm. But uh, my dad covered that song with the full uh, support and giddiness right. of Big Joe Turner. As in, in fact, Big Joe Turner and my dad were lifelong friends. And I was just talking to my mom the other day, and I was talking to her about where to go for a vacation this summer. And I, I mentioned New Orleans, and my mom said, oh, I'll, I'll never forget the time that uh, me, your dad, and Big Joe Turner uh, got drunk in New Orleans. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, tell me about that yeah, story. story. And, and she's like, well, it was, it was, it must have been in the early 60s, but I, I couldn't speak very, I couldn't speak English very well, but, and it was very hard for me to understand Big Joe Turner, but all I know is that he and, and your father had a, a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. We 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 watched the sun come up because um, I believe Big Joe Turner's from New Orleans. I'm not. I can't. Could I'm not, be, I'm yeah, not I'm sure. Not, but I'm but um, so you know. I mean, be, beyond that fact, I was going to say that um, the argument that that uh, that white musicians or any musicians steal somebody else's music is is a really touchy subject. I mean, for example, me being a, a and full disclosure here, my, my speciality is, is uh, classical music. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I can take you back to, you know, I could take you back to the 14th century right. and give you examples of where musicians have stolen other musicians' music or at least appropriated it without giving credit, you yeah. know. And, of course, that, that, didn't very, that didn't happen at all in the 50s. I mean, mm -hmm. whoever wrote the music yeah, they knew who were, was given, recording it. Were, were given proper credit for yeah. it. Now, the, where, where it gets dirty mm -hmm. is when music was stolen mm -hmm. and rewritten, new lyrics were given to right. something, you know, and that rarely happened. The, mo the people who really did that were promoters mm -hmm. and managers. Right. The, so, the the real skeezers in the business are the yeah. ones that did that. It wasn't the musicians. It, I mean, if anybody, most musicians, uh, and I am one, most musicians are very, very um, apt in to give credit where credit is due because they appreciate the music more than anybody else does. They know the beauty of it, and right. they understand that if I didn't write that, the person who did deserves the credit. And what you would, what would uh, just to kind of, 
get Brandon in the loop here, what would happen in the 50s was rock and roll was just starting. It was just coming into being. There weren't a lot of people writing rock and roll songs. So what they were doing was all these people were influenced by the blues. They would take Big Mama Thornton songs, you know, Muddy Water songs, add a, like, a rockabilly beat to it, change it up, and record it. Yeah. And their versions would get played on the radio. Yeah. On mainstream radio. And that, that the black wasn't... artists were not getting played on mainstream yeah. radio. Yeah, so this was a way to get their music out there. And, and therefore, steal. they're blamed for that. Yeah, they yeah, get I mean, why, stealing, why, why, they why do you blame somebody for that? I mean, number one, you got to pay the bills. Yeah. Everybody's got to pay the bills. Yeah. But number two, I mean, um, for example, um, my dad and his band at the time in 1951, they recorded a song called Rocket 88, who uh, was, was originally written by Jackie Branston. And um, if, I, if memory serves me correct, I believe Ike Turner, a really young Ike Turner, was a member of that band. But, um, and it was a very R&B mm-hmm. song. Yeah. I mean, it was a very, very bluesy R&B tune, mm-hmm. much slower. And my dad's band, what they did, and this is the incredibly unique thing about it, is that they didn't cover the song note for note. Mm-mm. I mean, they took this Western swing style of music mm-hmm. that they were doing and tried to sing an R&B song with a Western swing beat. Okay, exactly. And this is 1951. This is this is one year after the Korean War has begun. Mm-hmm. This is a very early time period. Dwight Eisenhower is still president. I mean, this is incredibly ad- advanced thing to happen, you know, mm-hmm. but... To, to, to just finish up my point about it, uh, for example, you know, two, two of the greatest musicians of the class of the of what we call classical music, Johann Sebastian Bach, he, um, he discovered through, you know, a long list of people, he received a manuscript of a bunch of music by an Italian composer and Bach considered it to be very unique and very interesting music. And Bach knew the composer, the the composer's name was on the music, but Bach, what he did was that he appropriated the music, rewrote it from violin for what it was originally written for, and um, arranged it for keyboard instruments, Mm -hmm. and then, and then uh, put it out there or performed it as his own music. Now that is that's a little bit underhanded. Yeah, that's more stealing. That's than, that's a than, little bit underhanded. And your dad and, covering and, Rocket eighty eight. And yeah. musicologists later on, hundreds of years later, have now discovered that after putting them putting uh, recordings really helped figure this out. And what Bach did was actually steal Antonio Vivaldi's music. Mm. And um, you know, and whether whether Bach gave Vivaldi credit or not for that, it just gives you an example of how long this kind of appropriation of somebody else's music because of appreciation mm-hmm. of the quality mm-hmm. that it is done yeah. and and uh you know uh for example rocket 88 when it was when it was recorded by my dad everybody who wrote that song was given the proper credit for it right. the i mean it wasn't a giant hit anyway it is now recognized as a as a unique recording because it was it was a very strange Mm -hmm. If you listen to it now, you know, it's almost like watching the Wright Brothers fly, you know, it's a, it's, I listened to it the other day. I wanted to hear it again. So did, um, did Bach not, you know, use Google and be able to (laughs) (laughs) like, Hey, you know, this is a volunteer. I don't believe Bach (laughs) Bach was such a genius. I don't believe he needed Google. Yeah. Yeah. He He looked way into the, to the future and realized what he was doing. To to elaborate (laughs) on what, Pedro saying for some some examples. Well, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. Right, so. exactly. Yeah. Arthur Crudup wrote uh, "That's All Right, Mama." Right. Elvis recorded it. You know, Crudup got all the credit. It says plainly on the record. Mm-hmm. Arthur Crudup mm-hmm. wrote it. Uh, came probably Elvis's first big great song that put him on the map. Yeah. And uh, and by, was, by the way, the people who write the songs get mm-hmm. more money than the people that perform. Oh the yeah, songs. absolutely. The thing, the thing about that too, though, is that I mean. Blues, when you talk about blues music and where a lot of that came from, a lot of these blues guys, I mean, there's like four riffs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can hear a blues album from front to finish, and it's the same song 
eight times with just a little bit different guitar and a little bit you well, know, different. Things haven't music. changed a whole lot. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Mean, and not just in blues music. I mean, it happens in every kind of music. I yeah. mean, but to say that you're stealing, you know, something like yeah. that is, you know, especially then when they were saying this is mm-hmm. the guy who wrote it. This is where I got it from. Yeah. I think the fact that there wasn't internet back then, yeah. you know, made it so that you had to do the research. You had to figure out mm-hmm. through years of research right. that this is something that someone else had already done, or this sounded like something else. So. And and here's so. another point that I'd like to make. Um, uh, so these these musicians <clears throat> from the 50s and even the 40s uh, get um, blacklisted or well th- probably that's not that's not Just appropriate vilified, but yeah. vilified in a sense for doing uh, for for performing black musicians music um, but 10 years later or 15 years later when Led Zeppelin or the Who Mm-hmm. cover these blues songs there's oh, yeah. no then problem oh yeah that's great then there's no yeah. problem with it is there yeah exactly yeah. and you know and the one right. artist we've talked about it too the one artist that gets vilified the most from the 50s is pat boone pat because boone. Yeah. that a lot of people viewed him as this clean-cut white guy who has no basis in rock and roll he can't play an instrument all he's all he can do is sing and here he's doing tutti frutti mm-hmm. long tall sally ain't that a shame yeah. and selling more records than little richard and fats domino was mm-hmm. but what you know what people are forgetting is Fats Domino wrote that song. He got paid for it. Yeah. Little Richard wrote Tutti Frutti and Long Toss Alley. He got paid for it. He sure did. Made, got paid more for Pat Boone doing it than their records because their records weren't getting played on the radio. But that's for some good, reason, that's he a is very the, good point. That's actually a really good point because Randy makes a point because because uh, little Finally. I mean as many <laughs> recordings episodes. as many recordings as Little Richard's songs would have sold, he's infinitely more uh, successful. I mean, I don't know how well Little Richard is, uh, thankfully he's still with us, but yeah. I don't know how well he profited from Pat Boone's recordings, but he certainly did well off of them. Yeah, I, I would say he would have, because this, he was lucky He he was lucky enough to, well, not lucky enough, he's talented enough to write those songs, mm-hmm. but lucky enough to have somebody like Pat Boone, who was a major name at that time yeah. and sold a lot of records. Sold a lot of records. And, and if things were... Uh, th- Especially today and in, in mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. The, uh, the music industry is is much better regulated. Yeah. And now, uh, Richard Pennyman, mm-hmm. <laughs> or yeah. Little Richard, yeah. is probably getting his his proper due because mm-hmm. you know, like I like I said once again, once again to re- reiterate, uh, the real demons in this business were the managers, the entrepreneurs, and the the owners of the record companies. They're mm-hmm. the ones that were really ripping people off, mm-hmm. yeah, including the artists. Yeah. So. Well, speaking yeah. about how much money Little Richard made off Pat Boone, I don't know exactly, but I do know that it was a well-famous story that Fats Domino one time was being interviewed about Pat Boone you know, singing Ain't That a Shame, and he said, all I know is if Pat wants to sing any other of my songs, I need a new car. So in other words, he obviously knew he got a lot of money yeah, off Fats Domino. Sure, off yeah, Pat yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and, and Big Joe Turner didn't have any problem with, with with all of that. I mean, they were good friends. My dad returned, uh, in a sense, returned the favor when, when Big Joe Turner in, this, in the, uh, it must have been in the early 70s or maybe, well, I don't, I think Big Joe, Big Joe Turner passed away in the 70s. But yeah. in the 60s, my dad returned the favor by, by getting Big Joe Turner a recording contract in Mexico. Oh, really? And... So Big Joe Turner went down to Mexico City and recorded some music down there that got that got him mm. some income, mm-hmm. much needed income, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, he's from Kansas City, by the way. Oh, okay, so that okay. makes sense. Who knew? But I know that he lived in New Orleans because, mm-hmm. at the time, because my mom tells a funny story all about this. How um, every time my dad would go on tour. They'd drive up from wherever they were living at the time, and they'd pass through New Orleans. And when they'd go through New Orleans, my dad would call Big George Turner's house and, um, you know, wanting to go out on a nice, nice run, nice uh, Bourbon Street run with Big George Turner. And he was never at the house. And my mom could never understand the lady who was speaking because, like I said, my <laughs> mom was just learning English and to and to uh, to understand the. Uh, Someone from the, Louisiana. <laughs> some, well, I mean, but but an, an African American woman speaking in a very heavy Southern Louisiana right. accent was like, you know, French. You mm, know, might as well I be mean, speaking Klingon. Well, she probably point. could understand French better than she could have understood that lady. You yeah. Know? Well, you know, you were, you touched on it earlier about how the people from the fifties, aside from Elvis, don't get the 
credit any we're not credit but they they kind of dropped off the face of the earth in the early yeah. 60s yeah. as far as mainstream radio and and mm-hmm. the like yeah and a lot of that had to do of course with the beatles that that hurt a lot um uh, and it seems like from the beatles era on all that era all the great musicians from that era are lauded and mm-hmm. praised yeah uh but, but really the, the only one the, from the 50s that yeah. survived was elvis yeah um I am obviously very biased, uh, you know, when it comes to Elvis, I don't, I don't consider him to be, with the exception of maybe the early recordings, I haven't really found anything that he did beyond that that was to my liking. It disturbs me very much that people give Elvis Presley as much credit uh, for what he did as an origin- originator of rock and roll, uh, when there are so many other people that are as just as deserving, there including are. including my father, including your father. Yeah. But you know what I thought was interesting was like we've talked about all that music was coming together at the same time, and yet the great ones, and I'm going to include I have, I'm several great ones. The great ones had their own sound. Little Richard did not sound like Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry did not sound like Fats Domino. Bill Haley didn't sound like any of them. They were all Elvis very didn't sound like anybody. They all had their great sound. They had worked with their bands. They'd found the music they liked, mm-hmm. and they created their own sound. Buddy Holly had a totally different sound than, yeah. than anybody. Well, that's the that's the fascinating thing about that era, and that's why I've always been so uh, in love with fifties music. Is because at that point in time, and I'm talking about from 1954 to probably about 1959. Yeah. Um, a very short amount of time yeah, you know uh there each one of these artists that was coming out they were singing music that was portraying very regional styles mm-hmm. yep. and and uh after the beatles came along um i would have to say that that things became the, the homogeneity of music came along mm-hmm. and it it increased very much so after that but before that i mean you had some incredibly interesting music you know like i've i've always been a great admirer of eddie cochran i mm-hmm. mean i i think that he was a truly truly unique guy i mean he was a kid mm-hmm. he was t- 21 years old i believe when he passed away mm-hmm. i mean he was a, he was a kid was a tragedy, yeah. and then an incredibly talented guitarist i'm a guitarist myself so i i know what i speak of when it comes to that and and uh you know i um uh, chuck berry you know i there there's there's no words to to describe the the accomplishments of what chuck berry has done i right. mean um little richard uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis was a very good boogie woogie pianist, yeah. you know, and uh, um, if if he would have toned down his his uh, on his off stage antics, life. you know, <laughs> Persona. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he would have been as popular as he did, but it's yeah. incredible that people that have lived that lifestyle mm-hmm. and and that's another thing that Artie Shaw pointed to in that documentary about jazz, is that the music business is a killer. Mm-hmm. It kills people, and it it still does it today. You know, entertainment in general is is vicious to people, and and and. Uh, uh, some people thrive in it, and some people cannot. Yeah. And um, you know, I I believe that when my father was a very very private man who had demons that I, for some reason, he either hid or wasn't able to to control. And one of those things was just the absolute angst and bitterness at the fact of two things: one, that he believed that he had been a major player in creating one of the truly unique things about the United States Mm -hmm. and he wasn't given credit for that and I don't believe it's it's gotten worse since he's passed away yeah but the other thing that that really um, bothered him is that he never really got a chance to do what he loved which was to really to, to sing country music you know uh, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis has been around. He's still with us. It's incredible. Yeah, I saw him I just, a couple of years ago. I just don't, yeah. I don't, I can't believe he's still around. Yeah. I can't believe it. Chuck Berry is still with us. How mm-hmm. is it possible? How, yeah. how, after the life these men have led, mm-hmm. is it incredible? It's incredible that they're, they're, that they've made it this far. You oh, know, I've... Bo Diddley's gone. Bo Diddley was another person who brought a truly unique style of music. I mean, it was, it was, yeah, it was really unique. 
uh, Bo Diddley was, I, I, I got a chance to know him several times and he was a great guy and a, and a, a really sweet man, very humble and gave a lot of credit to everybody of that time. Carl yeah. Perkins, yeah, Let's not, Carl Perkins, yeah. uh, what a great musician, you know, somebody who <laughs> probably, if anybody got mistreated by the, um, fame mm-hmm. of Elvis Presley. There's a, it was a story that was nice, though. It was a good story. They were buddies. And Elvis uh, wanted to do Blue Suede Shoes because he liked it. Carl Perkins wrote it. And Carl Perkins said, can you give me a, a break and, and wait and release yours? Give me six months of this being my record. And Elvis said, absolutely. So he waited six, seven months before he released it. So he wasn't totally mean to him. He he did give him a break. But sir, you think Blue Suede Shoes, you think of Elvis, you don't think of Carl Perkins. Right. And well, that and that is a tragedy. Well, that's, that's not unfortunate. I mean, yeah. not for me. I mean, when I think of Blue Suede mm-hmm. Shoes, I think of Carl Perkins, yeah. and I think of how much better a musician Carl Perkins was oh, than yeah. Elvis Presley. Yeah. Elvis Presley <laughs> was a performer. I mean, let's you know, wax poetic. He was a performer. I mean, the the, yeah. the, the thing is, great and, voice, and, it, and it, yeah. it, for all uh, le- for for all the men out there who uh, are not uh, glamorous and and. Uh, um, Handsome men, you know the most <laughs> handsome men, the Dos Equis, uh model. This guy, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. uh, us three here at the table, you know, we we hate to. I mean, I, I, you know, it was uh, my dad was no movie star. He was not a, a a beautiful man or anything like that. And and I'm not, I'm not trying to cut my dad down. He was just a regular Joe, right. you know. But but to compete with the likes of somebody like Elvis Presley who was obviously you know an, a very good looking man and talented in his own right he could sing yes but you know he 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 had a manager mm-hmm. that knew exactly what to do mm-hmm. you know he plus, told him what to do yeah. plus he wiggled weird that's what, like ta- that. that's what yeah, i'm talking about that's what i'm talking about i'm telling i'm the showmanship i'm, I'm yeah, talking the showmanship about and johnny well. cash did say that he was the best rhythm guitar player he'd ever seen mm. so i don't know and Johnny Cash had twenty dollars in his wallet for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take a little break here. It's the uh, second third of the uh, the Kane F Land Sarah. What do you guys think of this? You've it's, all smoked it before, yeah, so. yeah. But I haven't smoked it in a few months, and I'll smoke another few in the next month. Yeah, I'm I'm right. buying a box. Oh, you are. Yeah, oh, not wow. from here though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying a box there right after this. Discount, right? Yeah, yeah. no, I'm you buying it here. Just now lost your me? discount. No, I'm buying it here. Store. Okay. Don't be a jerk face. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, we're back for the final third of the Cane F. Lancero with Pedro Haley. Yummy. Uh, yummy. It is tasty, yeah. It's delicioso. Pedro Haley, the son of Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and founding father. That's Bill right. Haley. So let's talk about cigars for a little bit. Uh, Pedro, you are in the same kind of realm that I am as far as being about a year and a half, two years into mm-hmm. cigars. Yeah. What did you start out with and what did you end up with? Where are you at now? What's your favorites? What did you like when you started? don't like now because of that well you know what i i actually it's funny because my introduction to cigars was through a friend of my wife's and um they he brought me here to calypso Mm -hmm. and um uh, matt badoski the the owner of calypso recommended a couple of cigars um small cigars because i didn't you know i just wanted to give it a shot and he he gave me a wonderful 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 cigar that i still admire very much and that's the um the spanish rosado by uh and i'll say it correctly partagas right <clears throat> partagas yeah which means uh, yes what well that mean? that's actually it's a surname i love the story it's a, now it's it. a surname but you could say uh parting gas <laughs> yeah or, or uh <laughs> Yeah. That's, a, that's a loose translation. Yeah, yeah. but no. but in English it'd be partagas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, partagas. Uh, the Spanish Rosado uh, mix is is wonderful. It uh, really is a good cigar. Have you ever had that? Yeah, I've had that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good smell. Yeah. It is tasty. Yeah. And um, you know, so I I really was uh, I had, I really liked that very much. I um, I've kind of st- stuck with the classics. You know, I'm a big fan of Upman. Mm-hmm. I like Upman cigars very much. The 1844 Reserve is a very good cigar. They have a beautiful cigar. Uh, Randy doesn't doesn't know it. Uh, he should, but uh, they're sun grown, 
is it's uh, the only thing in the world I don't know. Is yeah. this fact? It's right a, here. It's okay. A, it's a it's a great <laughs> cigar. I love the Upman Sun Grown. Um, you know, oh, I know the cigar. I just don't like the cigar. Oh, okay. That's okay. what it is. Yeah, we've got you it. Don't, you don't like Sun Grown. That's I'm not a Sun Grown fan. Yeah. I'm not yeah. a big Sun Grown fan either, but I'll try it yeah. because you recommended it. And there's there's a few Sun Growns I like, but it's it's hit or miss. It's kind of like you are with the uh, the Mexican wrappers, where you don't yeah. you think there's only a couple people to do it. Yeah, right. yeah. Mexican cigar. Well, like I said, you know, we I I grew up. And by Mexican in, rappers, I don't mean Gerardo. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Rico Suave. I I, I grew up Ricky in Ricky Martin. I grew up in Veracruz, yeah. which is the the state in which all Mexican tobacco was grown, uh, especially what the, the the famous San Andres. Uh, and he says it right. Tobacco, mm-hmm. yeah, not San San Andreas. San Andreas. No, it's San Andres. It, San Andrea is Saint Andrea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, San Andres is Saint Andrew. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, um, San Andres wrapper and, and many cigars that I've tried that that mix in Mexican tobacco, just in my opinion, uh, really mess it up. You know, I I I ad- here in Texas uh, there seems to be some some very strange bias towards Mexican cigars. So you can barely find any Teamos anywhere. And when I do find them, I, I try and buy some because I enjoy them. I, I do think they're, they're worthwhile cigars. Now, they're not uh, <clears throat> Ashton's or anything like that by any, by any name, but they're not priced that way either. You yeah. know? Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think a good cigar is determined by the name or the price tag. It's really mm-hmm. what you like. I, you know? I, I absolutely agree. I mean, there are some, uh, some of the best cigars I've had have been the unbanded, what they call the seconds, yeah. you know? Some of those are, are just fantastic cigars. Yeah, those you know? uh, Alec Bradley seconds we that, have here. That I got great. here were, Spicy, were, delicious cigars, mm-hmm. yeah. were wonderful. Uh, at another shop, I bought um, a big, some, a couple of Churchills for 250 by Quesada. Mm-hmm. That were that were that are great. They're just you know for two fifty a big Churchill of a wonderful wonderful blend is a, a great find. I love to be able to 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 find those those gold mines of of these cheap cigars that are really good. You know, yes. Jr. makes a, a Jr. They make all these knockoffs, and and one of them is a, a, a Padron uh, knockoff. That is, we don't mention them on the air, though. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, no, they were, I, I smoked that one he gave me. It was good. Yeah. I just teased. Yeah, and, and he can I, bleep that out. No, I'm not bleeping. <laughs> uh, one just, just great. You know. Yeah, you um, gave me one. It was a good cigar. There, it was a good cigar. There's all. Um, I've, I've been in it. There's a couple of mixes by Padilla uh, that are uh, really, really good. I admire them. Although, what that was that is, one uh, you gave me? It's uh, La Terraza Capa Habano. And they don't yeah. make that anymore. Not made anymore. So every time I Damn run you, across, well, every time I run across that cigar, I buy as many as I can, and I can't find any. And see, I've run into the Padilla wall because I, I, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I buy stuff off the internet occasionally, and I've gotten some Padillas that were just not good. And I, think I have they, too. They yeah. put the crap out there on the internet. Not off the, the internet, but just yeah. if I see one, some somebody's got like one, you know, yeah. and I'll buy it, and it's just like there's one called Casadores, which is just not good. You know, yeah. it, it's not good, but there's there there's it's not made anymore. But it's called La Terraza by Padilla, and it's and it's it's very good. They have a Habano wrapper and an Oscuro, and both of them are very good. Um, you know, I it runs the gamut. I'm I'm a rookie in the sense, you know, I'm still learning and still looking around, and and uh, I've been surprised by many many things. I mean, I uh, those. Um, Esteban Carreras, mm-hmm. those uh, the Chupacabra is is fantastic. The Covenant is great. Um, the 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 Diez Años, all three of those are just yeah, really fantastic. great cigars. Yeah. Um, to me, I think you know. For me, I kind of kind of equate it to this. For for cigars, it's like it's like piecing together a puzzle. You know, you start off and you think this is going to be a fifty piece puzzle. I'm going to get some pieces here that I like. I'm going to put it together and it's going to make a cohesive image that this is the cigars that I like. But as you progress and you smoke more cigars, you realize this is a thousand five hundred piece puzzle that's mostly space, and there's an X wing in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. I don't know what I'm gonna like. I'm gonna try a lot of things. Right. Occasionally, you'll get a piece that fits, yeah. and you just—I mean, I take notes. I'm, yeah. I'm big on that. I'll like, oh, I like this cigar. I'm gonna write it down, put some tasting notes on it, and I've even got a spreadsheet because I'm a nerd. Wow. Where you know, I know if Okey I want dokey. a certain kind of cigar, <laughs> he is a nerd. This is what I look for, Man. and it's—you know—I think it's—you kind of have to do that because I'm old. I'm 42. I forget what I smoke. 
And for me to, you know, smoke, especially with these guys, Give, hand me stuff all the time. Will you please and, not? Come on. Yeah. We're all the same age. <laughs> we're, all, really? we're all probably all within months of each other. Good Lord. <laughs> I'm old, just come saying. On. I'm just saying, you know, it's a, you smoke so many cigars, you kind of forget what He's you smoke. He's got kids, so the age is Ah, uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, I'm aged yeah. 10 years automatically because yeah. I have kids, and I have a 14-year-old that's like. He's got a four-year-old. That probably, yeah. a four, 14 and four, so there's a gap there where my daughter loved my daughter my 14 year old loved my four-year-old when she was two but now she's like they hate you know so there's other, yeah. a certain amount of brain matter that just goes yeah. out the head because yeah. you're too busy yelling at your kids mm-hmm. so yeah there are there i i love um well of course i uh la flor dominicana has a special place because um I don't think I've ever had a cigar by them that oh well there is one uh, Coronado that Ooh, was that not was, yeah, not, that not that great but, I wasn't a big fan of that either. but everything else they've made has we been we got rid of them though has yeah. been, uh, thanks a lot I think I got a couple of those in the five pack <laughs> in the, just kidding has been a home run you know and, and, and it, like I said I'm not an expert I'm not a I'm not a sommelier of cigars mm. but um, you know like dropping the big words <laughs> everybody everybody says in this in this in this um uh, I don't know what you would call this hobby, you know, that uh, it, it's really just so subjective. And, and, yeah, and with any really, hobby, it, with it, any hobby. Yeah, it's, it's, it really yeah. is. But there are some some cigars that really stand out. And for me, I mean, every time I have uh, like an Upman, uh, I just can't I just got to say, you know, you know, these guys are always consistent and they're always good. You know, and that's why they've been around for over a hundred years. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. and um, even though they transferred from from Cuba to where are they in the DR now, I guess so they're yeah. coming out of the DR. Well, they made the transfer very well. They successfully did it. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. see for me, it's it's I've got two brands that I kind of latched onto that I like a whole lot, and one's Padron, mm-hmm. and I wasn't a big Padron guy when I started out, but now I've really started to appreciate them, and there's just a lot in that line. That number one, they're good when you buy them, but they age really well. Yeah. And they're just great cigars, hands well, down. Well, they're, they're just they're way out of my league for me. Yeah. I, I I try and stay below uh, ten dollars for a cigar, but yeah, but uh, I mean, try the core line, like the two thousand, the four thousand. Oh, those are great. I yeah, love those. Are those those I mean, are yeah, very you know, the, good cigars. Yeah, the twenty six and stuff. Yeah, yeah, those are pricey, and those are good every once in a while. But, but those I'll J- have a those, those instead JR, of twenty six. Yeah, those JR yeah, inter- yeah, imitations great. that I got are are probably in the same league as the thousand series. Yeah. And I kind of had to ease my way into Fuente because I wasn't a real big fan at the start because I, mm-hmm. I yeah. think it's a Cameroon thing. But you I know, agree I, with you. A lot of those now, you know. So well, I what happened? I had a the funny story about Fuente with me is that I stayed away from it for a long time simply because I it was just such a big name every every cigar shop I went into it was inundated with the Fuente name everywhere and I was like you know what if everybody's got them and they're always available I've got plenty of time to try something else before I come to Fuente that is funny I had that exact same thought you know when I was first buying you know, Macanudo was the it for me. You know, I loved Macanudo, and I noticed that a lot I of the Fuentes were the same price as Macanudo. And I was like, yeah, but I know I like Macanudo, and this Fuente seems to be everywhere. It seems like they're shoving Fuente down my throat, wanting me to smoke Fuente. So I stayed away from them. <laughs> yeah. And then when I had Hater. one one time, I liked it, but I'm kind of like you guys. It took me a while to grow yeah. into it. But Fu- yeah, Fuente cool. is also I have to you know I have to give credit to that because once I I had one, I realized that um, they have the same the same as uh work well uh you know i'm not a businessman so i don't know how to put it in the terms but they 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 run their business the right way the way that upman has done it i mean they've stayed they they make a very good product and it's incredibly consistent yeah now if they could if they could only straighten out their band and their <laughs> we talked about that uh, several the, times the yeah. rapper situation so you knew exactly what in the hell you are buying yeah. you know you could and you could understand exactly what it is because d- double chateau fuente double x i mean you know what i this is just utterly confusing you know yeah. sometimes you I just, think you i think know. what happens and i'm i'm going to be serious not I think what happens is there's every cigar manufacturer has a little room full of wordsmiths. Yeah. That come up with the most confusing words for naming any cigar. <laughs> why can't just every cigar be a Churchill Robusto Toro Corona? Yeah. Why yeah. do you, why does everything you know as a Rosa Pelagroso? The company that is the worst uh, 
of all in that is Gurkha. You know, oh, Gur- yeah. Gurkha oh, just gives their cigars. Some the of their names, names just are almost offensive in a way. You know, it's kind of <laughs> like it conjures an image of killing someone just from the yeah. name of their cigar. Spec Ops. Yeah. Give yeah. me a break. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Gurkha Intimidator. Yeah. 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 The Gurkha gut stabber. I don't. That's yeah, not a real one. Yeah. But that the Gurkha one. chainsaw yeah. massacre. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you know HBO and George R. R. Martin and Gurkha all get together and have an entire Game of Thrones line <laughs> of cigars. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the one that's the what's the kid that everybody hates? <laughs> that's the king. <laughs> that Joffrey. Yeah, yeah. Jo- the, the Joffrey wouldn't sell. No, to, no, no, <laughs> no, no. That guy's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know we could cuss on this yeah, show. Yeah, you said hell a couple times. Well. Oh, that's not really a cuss word anymore. No, because it's double hockey sticks. It's yeah. in the Bible. It <laughs> yeah, can't be a right. cuss word, right? They don't cuss in the Bible. Uh, you were going to tell the story real quick oh. of the mysterious box of Bill Haley cigars. Yeah. Um, well, my dad was a two and a half pack a day cigarette smoker. Um, you know, he was born in 1925, so he's part of the greatest generation that. Uh, you know, came out where smoking did not cause any harm. It was actually healthful for you. you yeah. Know? Anyway, he developed quite a habit, but he also smoked cigars, and um, uh, he passed away in 81, and my mom just kind of vacuum-sealed every single possession that, that she had of my dad's, and uh, only not... V- out of any kind of uh, malicious intent, but mm-hmm. she just packed it away and reserved it for her own because my mother, you know, obviously was quite devastated with the pass of, passing of my dad and, and really wanted to just hold on to everything that she had left of him for herself mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in a very strangely selfish way, I guess I, I, right. I would have to say. But um, one day, uh, for purposes of her will, we had to do an inventory of all of my dad's possessions as to who would get what when my mom passed on, etc. And uh, we were going through all of this, and all of a sudden, uh, my mom pulls out a humidor uh, with my dad's initials engraved onto this little brass plate at the top. And it's a it's a big humidor, you know, it's a it's a it's a hundred to it's probably a hundred hundred um, count count thank yeah. you and uh, alongside with it was another box of cigars and of course these cigars are are uh, you know probably better for building fires now than they are for smoking although Randy says that they can be revived but um, anyway there's a chance there's revive. a chance yeah I you know I, I was I had I had just at that moment been you know getting into the the cigar world and and i discovered these and i was just absolutely intrigued um especially since when i looked at the brand i'd never heard of it and uh they're called uh that's a hard one in spanish ejecutivo which translates to executive and um i haven't seen it in over a year now i haven't seen the cigars in over a year so i can't inspect them again but they were all in cellophane the ones in the humidor were were uh, probably in much better shape, but not anymore. And it's been 30 years. But um, uh, I looked up the brand on the internet to see if I could come up with anything. Nothing. Wow. I I I, I can pre Al Gore. I would have to. <laughs> I'd, I'd venture to say that these are probably Mexican cigars that he mm-hmm. bought in Veracruz, mm-hmm. and. Uh, um, you know, I mean, it, it'd be nice if if I could get a hold of them, if I could pull them away from my mom to to invest uh, the responsibility of reviving them mm-hmm. to you guys and seeing it. You know, yeah. we'll help you. We'll do to, it. We'll to be, bring them back great around. Review on this great, side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'd be a great project too, and it'd it be some be. preservation I, I mean, for your dad. Who knows I, what quality they are? I mean, I, I I'd be shocked if they were actually cubans i mean but it the possibility is there that Absolutely. they actually might be cubans yeah I they're mean, probably we pre-embargo did, cubans we yeah. did mm-hmm. we did li- we did live in veracruz which is the major port of mexico that connects to havana quite easily mm-hmm. i mean that was but um who knows uh it's a fascinating little thing with the a cigar uh um they, so they, pe- people in, uh, interested in cigars, you know. Be, yeah, we have the technology. You know, we're going to get. You know, we're going to get 
comments and for people. I want a Bill I, Haley I cigar. So, yeah. I, I want a yeah. Bill Haley cigar. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, this, uh, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, but I, I smoked an 80 year old, 80 plus year old cigar. I heard about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a German cigar. Yeah. And uh, it was from 1929 or 26, 26 27. Yeah, I figured out it was 87 yeah. years old. Yeah, but, um, it was a German made cigar, but yeah. but it was American tobacco. It was a, yeah, no, it? it's it's Cuban tobacco. It was well, I mean, that's too. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was fantastic. It smoked great. I mean, I had it in my humidor for probably close to a year, mm-hmm. and um, you know, it was it was awesome. So wow. yeah, I mean, those those can be restored, man. Yeah, yeah. You talk to your mom, and we'll yeah. get it in a good yeah. Word. I should Tell I should see if if we can get a tour that. <laughs> to preserve your dad's legacy, we want to see if we can salvage these cigars. We won't smoke them. We yeah. want to we uh, fix them. Yes, $150 a cigar. <laughs> yes, that's what we'll sell them <laughs> yeah. for. That's what you sell them to us for, then we'll sell them for 200 yes, a piece. Okay. That way we make, right. everybody makes money on the deal. I just want to help you restore them. I mean, yeah, that's fun. all we want to do. Absolutely. That'd be fun. That yeah, would be a, that'd be fun a nice project. project yeah. That would be cool. Great project. And we'd be let's preservationists. Make a, let's make a documentary about it. Well, everybody, you uh, want we should mention that you can find us on Potomatic, iTunes, Spreaker, Slam, Slam Internet, Internet Radio, Radio, and YouTube with the slideshow. Uh-huh. And I have an idea. While you're on U- uh, iTunes, I was going to say YouTunes, if you're on iTunes, uh, not only subscribe to us and listen to our stuff, but look up Bill Haley and buy some Bill Haley records, especially if you're not familiar with it. Get to know this music. This was He was one of the four forefathers he was right there in the beginning and help out the haley family buy some bill haley records <laughs> and 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 uh, yeah. kill two birds with one stone because you'll you'll love them they're great I, I just downloaded seven or eight the other day that i yeah. had listened to and they're fantastic yes definitely so thanks for smoking with us guys we'll see you next week you know ladies and gentlemen the, the hour is late the tapes are running out we would like to say one thing thank you very much rock and roll revival if it means having audiences like you and uh, places like this to work by I think the New York Post said today, I didn't expect them to print it, but they did in the article today, and I mean it. When I'm 75, and if you can still clap your hands, I can still hold a guitar. We'll still have rock and roll. I'll still be playing, all right? One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Five, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock, we're going to rock.
one more time.